and goals of NCD services. Dr. Barbosa, welcome and over to you. Morning. Thank you, Anselm. Good morning. Uh, first, I want to congratulate the Anselm and the, the whole staff of the department. Uh, I think that this is a very important initiative indeed to organize this webinar series. I think that the, uh, the, the, the pandemic is not only a, a, a problem uh, related to the cases and deaths that uh, it has produced in the world and in our region, but the, the impacts that the pandemic uh, has produced also for many public health priorities that uh, during the last year and this year so far are being affected very importantly by the pandemic and its effects. So I, I will share with you a, a presentation uh, trying to, to cover the, what's the, the current situation of the pandemic. Let me find it here. Just a moment. Just a moment, sorry, I'm trying to, I'm trying to find the, the correct screen. I don't know what is happening because I am having problem to. I can see many other outlook, but I cannot see the. Well, wait, wait for Dr. Barbo. So just to let everyone know that um, welcome to uh, everyone to the the meeting, and we actually have had over a thousand registrations, and so far we're seeing um, approaching th over three hundred seventy five people are actually in the room with us as we as we as we register. And just to remind you that you can participate in the language of your choice, English or Spanish, and it's in the globe at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. So Dr. Barbosa, I'm handing it back over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think that now you can see the, the presentation. It's a summary of the situation that you have in the region. Just to remind us that the non-communicable diseases are the leading cause of death in the America. Around the 81% of the total mortality is related to uh, non-communicable uh, diseases, but it's always important to call the attention that the, around 34% of these deaths are premature deaths. Many of them, or most of them, are preventable. So we are not talking about the uh, natural uh, end of uh, the, the life. We are talking about the uh, totally unacceptable burden of the deaths that they are affecting people between 30 and 70 years that can be prevented with the current strategies that and tools that are available. Here is a, a, a snapshot of the situation of the Americas uh, among the other uh, five regions of WHO about the, the most important risk factors. As you can see on the left side, we are number one, and it's bad. It's bad to be in this position uh, about the prevalence of physical inactivity in adults. On the right side, now you can see the biological risk factors. We are number one for over, overweight and obesity in adults. Uh, prevalence of obesity in adults. We are the number one among the six regions, but also the prevalence of obesity in adolescents. We are the number one. So this is a. These are bad news. The good news here is that the, 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 the region is uh, performing better when we are talking about the, uh, <clears throat> the prevalence of current tobacco smoking adults. We are, the, the, uh, we are in position number five among the six, and also in prevalence of raising the blood pressure, pressure that we are the, the six. 
So we need to, to see how we can improve this, this data in our vision. It's important also to see that the, the current performance in the region is telling us that we are not achieve the global goal of 25% reduction in non-communicable disease premature mortality. So we need to, to review in every country in the region how we can uh, ensure more access for the people, uh, most, the most vulnerable population, people that have barriers to access, diagnosis, treatment. What are we missing? What are the best buys that we can implement in every country to accelerate the reduction of the prematurity, premature mortality in the region. COVID-19 has uh, affected the, the, the region very, very uh, hard. We have uh, now, uh, the, the, these figures have, have already changed, but you have around 50, uh, 55 million uh, cases. The Americans, we are responsible for 44% of the, the, the number total, the, the total number of cases in the world. We have more than 1.3 million uh, deaths related to COVID-19, around the 48%, almost half of the, the, the deaths that uh, have happened in the world are in the Americas. But the COVID-19 is not only a, a health problem, it is also social and economic. These are estimations from the from a clock about the reduction in the GDP in Latin America and the Caribbean is estimated around the almost eight percent. And the some countries were more affected. For instance, countries that rely in tourism, they they had the, uh, 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 an year in 2020 that with almost no activity at all. The the clock is also uh, estimating that we will reduce. Uh, with the reduction of per capita GDP, around the 85%, the poverty and the extreme poverty in the, in the Americas and in, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean will increase. Uh, the, the estimation is that we are going back almost one decade or more in terms of uh, the increase of poverty and extreme poverty. So many of the gains that the Latin American and the Caribbean countries have had in the last 20 years, uh, re reducing very, in a, in a very sustainable way, the, the percentage of the population living below the poverty line. And now we can, we can uh, these gains are at risk due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the International Monetary Fund is also uh, making very, very important estimations uh, showing how the economy and health are linked. Now we cannot think about how to recover uh, the economy if the transmission is not controlled. So it's very important to, to think about these uh, two dimensions working, working together in a synergistic way. It's also the, the, the pandemic highlighted many characteristics of the countries and the region. Uh, Unfortunately, Latin America and the Caribbean is one of the most inequitable regions in the world. And the, the pandemic affected in many different ways the most vulnerable population that you have, especially women, indigenous and Afro-descendant population, migrants and refugees, and the elderly people with 60 years of age and people with disabilities in Latin America and the Caribbean. These uh, groups were affected in a disproportionately uh, by the pandemic, and the, they are still at a higher risk to have COVID-19 uh, and to, to have a severe form of COVID-19 and also to die due to the uh, pandemic. In the US, they, they have very good disaggregated data but uh, we do believe that this, the, these figures are summarizing a situation that's not only the US, uh, but here you can see that the impact in the reduction of life expectancy due to COVID-19 is totally different when, when you think about the, the total population, uh, the life expectancy at the birth uh, is 
Due to the COVID-19, we will have an increase in around one year, but when we go to the Latin community in the US, the reduction is around four years. The reduction among the, the white population in the US is almost is one year, but the reduction among the Afro descendants in, in, in the US are also more than two years. So this is a kind of a summary of the inequalities because this, the Latino community, the Afro descendant community, they have less access to health services. So they have a, a higher prevalence of underlying conditions. And due to this historical uh, difficult to access health services, they, 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 they reach the services when the disease uh, sometimes is uh, beyond uh, any, any, any care possible. So here we have also, a, a, I think that's a very, a very important uh, summary of the, the high impact of COVID-19. Uh, when we, we see the forecast for the, the leading cause of death in the Americas, COVID-19 alone will be the second one. And the, also when we see lower respiratory uh, infections will be the sixth. So we are talking about some very important uh, cause of that, and COVID-19 will be more important than many other uh, leading cause of death. We are also talking about the impact of COVID-19, and, and PAHO is working with the Ministry of Health, with the countries, how to improve the response to COVID-19, but also how we can be better prepared to reduce the impact of COVID-19 for people living with non-communicable diseases. We have more than 250 million persons in the Americas with, some, with a chronic condition. We have people with hypertension, diabetes, or other non-communicable diseases that can be a very important risk uh, factor to develop a severe uh, COVID-19 disease. Uh, we, we, the, the figures that we have are stressing the, the relevance of many conditions, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, smoking, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cancer, chronic kidney disease, and others. Now, in the US, they have a six or higher hospitalization and 12 for the higher mortality in those with COVID and underlying condition versus uh, those without a chronic condition. And again, these are data for, for the US, but the, the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean probably are facing a very similar situation. Uh, we, th this is, a, this is a, 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 very important, a very important condition that we need to address in each country because we, are, we need to, to, to use all the tools that we have, how we can strengthen primary health care, how we can strengthen teleconsulting, telemedicine, how we can deploy medicines for people with uh, chronic conditions, how we can provide a safe environment in the health service in order to avoid that the people will delay uh, the diagnosis, the treatment, the follow-up, and, and, and to control their chronic conditions. Here are, are some data related to the increased risk of severe COVID-19 among people with uh, non-communicable diseases. And that this risk is around 24% uh, in the region of the Americas, 22% in Latin America, and 29% uh, in, the no, uh, in the Caribbean countries that are no latent. So this is a, a very important uh, relationship between non-communicable diseases and the, and the COVID-19 that we need to, to, to address in order to reduce the hospitalization, to reduce the, the mortality. It is also uh, imp uh, important to, uh, to highlight the links that we have between COVID-19 and non-communicable diseases. If stay at home measures sometimes are leading to an increase in some risks, unhealthy diets, insufficient physical activity, smoking tobacco and drinking alcohol. So these are, these are risky factors that the, some surveys are showing that they increased during the year 2020. 
uh, and we have also to take into account that during the peak of transmission, many health services are closed or the, the, the health workers uh, had to be diverted to hospitals, emergency uh, units. So it, this is also another, another difficult that, the, that people have. During the, the, the peak uh, of the transmission, also people and the people with uh, uh, non communicable diseases, uh, people, the, the elderly, they sometimes they, they don't feel safe to go to a, to a healthy facility. So this can reduce uh, elective clinic visits and lower access to renal dialysis, for instance, reduce also cancer diagnosis and care. Uh, delays in high priority treatments for patients with uh, non communicable diseases. These data are from uh, a survey uh, that was uh, conducted by PAHO about the non communicable disease service disruption during the pandemic. You can see that the, uh, 69% of the countries uh, responded the, uh, yes. Uh, where the list of essential health services in the countries was included in the COVID-19 response plan, but we have almost 21% uh, counts that they haven't included the continuity of non-communicable disease services in the COVID-19 response plan. So it's important to, to, to go country by country, to discuss, to review the plan, to see how we can uh, improve the plan to a more comprehensive response to COVID-19, not only focus on the reduction of the transmission of the virus, but also how we can protect the public health gains, how we can guarantee that, the, uh, in this case, non-communicable uh, disease services can uh, be open and, and working. Here is also from the survey about the service, uh, uh, service disruption we can see that for some hypertension man management, 45% of the countries related that the services were partially disrupted, 70% for cardiovascular emergence, but the 52% for diabetes and diabetic complications. When we, we also see cancer, even cancer treatment, 28% uh, had the serious problem we were partially disrupted. And when we see also for asthma, 28%. Rehabilitation services, the impact was, was worse because 21% of the, the, the countries reported that the, some services were completely disrupted. And also palliative care, 34%, and partially disrupted in 7%, 7% completely disrupted. Urgent uh, dental uh, care, also 41% of uh, partially disruption and 7% of completely disruption. So the impact is really very, uh, very important. Uh, here are some strategies that the, the countries have used to overcome this, this disruption. Uh, try, triaging, uh, the triage to identify uh, priorities was a very important strategy. 71% of the countries reported that they have used this. Telemedicine deployment to replace in-person consults, 63%. And we need to also to see how we can uh, enhance these, these strategies. Novel supply chain and your dispensing approaches for non-communicable diseases medicines were adopted by 58%. Redirection of patients uh, with non communicable diseases to alternate healthcare facilities were implemented by 54% uh, of the counties. Task shifting and role delegation uh, were, uh, was a strategy used by 38%. So we need to, to review very carefully and to adapt in each country what of these strategies used in combination can guarantee that the people with non-communicable diseases will, uh, will have their access uh, guaranteed during this, the, 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 this moment. Uh, we have released uh, uh, some technical guidance uh, about uh, how to, 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 to implement some measures to guarantee that the people will, will keep their conditions being properly treated uh, the, to, to ensure chronic disease management in primary health care maintained, if, if possible, 
vai, vai a telemedicine with a reduction in providing counters uh, to provide a three month supply of medication so people will not run uh, run out of their medicines uh, month by month. Uh, Council on self management to concentrate 24 hour acute care service and uh, designate hospital emergency units and ensure public awareness to promote uh, basic infection prevent, prevention measures in health services to avoid the outbreaks of COVID-19 among health professionals, and also to, 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 to prevent that the health facilities can be a, 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 a point, can be a, a risk to people that are looking for care, uh, to maintain availability of essential medicines and supplies, and to create a platform for reporting, inventory, stockouts, and for coordination of redistribution of supplies. These are some uh, a highlight about a, a comprehensive package of measures that, uh, that we need to adopt. Another, another very, important, uh, very important aspect that was stressed by the COVID-19 was about mental health. Mental health always uh, in many countries, I think that they haven't received the proper priority in their national plans. And this was uh, during the pandemic, I think that the, 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 all, all the countries needed to, 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 to start thinking how to respond to the mental health issues that, the, that were happening before the pandemic and were amplified, magnified by the, by the pandemic. Uh, globally, we know that in situations like the, 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 the situation that we are living now, one in five person presents a, presents a mental health condition. Uh, we have some data showing that mental health and substance use disorders already account for 34% of total disability in the Americas, so it's a very important uh, health problem. Uh, increasing the symptoms of depression, anxiety, and substance use relate to COVID-19 in many countries in Latin America, the Caribbean, in Canada, in the US. We, we, we have reported surveys uh, showing this. Uh, in Canada, 20 to 25% of those aged between 18 and 54 years have increased their alcohol consumption during COVID-19. In the US, 45% of adults indicated negative mental health impact due to worry and stress over the virus. Here we have data from Argentina, né, the general population and also among the healthcare workers, né, symptom of anxiety, uh, we, we had the, around the, uh, in the general population, 53% said that they, 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 they have uh, symptoms of anxiety. 47% uh, of the general population also uh, show, uh, show symptoms of depression. Among the healthcare workers, it is even more important as expected. 76% uh, relates that they have symptoms of anxiety and 81% and symptoms of depression because they are under a lot of stress these days. In conclusion, I think that the pandemic led to unprecedented loss of life, disruption, of health system and services and societies. Those living in vulnerable situations were most impacted. Uh, and for this reason, we needed to adopt specific strategies to reach out this population, vulnerable population, uh, the, the poorest communities in the big cities, the poor population in rural areas, Afro-descendants. So in each country, you need to identify uh, these uh, vulnerable populations and to adopt specific strategies to overcome the barriers and to guarantee that they have access to health services. The pandemic demonstrated an unexpected interplay between non communicable diseases, mental health, and an uh, infectious disease for which health systems were unprepared. So, this is a, a situation that we cannot respond targeting only the transmission of the virus, but we need this uh, comprehensive response. To, 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 to be effective. Uh, it's key to ensure that non communicable diseases and mental health are integrated into national COVID-19 response plans. Again, it's very important that the uh, preparation and response plans need to be updated and the, 
and it's very important that they they have incorporated the all the aspects that will prepare better the country to respond to this protracted uh, pandemic that probably will remain among us for many months uh, or years maybe ahead it is also critical to preserve the public health gains improve policies and fiscal measures for NCD risk factors scale up the the best buys the things that can be adopted in each country to reduce the prevalence of the risk factors, to integrate non-communicable disease and mental health in strengthening the primary health care, maintaining the innovation such as digital health. And we do believe that the digital health had a, a very important, received a very important push from the pandemic, but it, it will be important uh, after the pandemic, to keep this easy way to reach out to people with hypertension, with diabetes, uh, so you can monitor, provide support, it, uh, technical uh, guidance. So I think that this is a, 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 a very important opportunity to, 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 to adapt uh, the strategies that we have in order to be more present in the life of people, to support them uh, better. And it is also to, to discuss how we can use better the primary, uh, primary health care, uh, the, this, this idea that the primary health care uh, needs to be responsible and needs to be able with the capacity uh, to respond to the, to the needs of the population. So uh, this will be a very important uh, pillar to guarantee that the, the communities will have the access to, to, to health service. It's also important to have strategic investments uh, for transforming the health system, a more resilient uh, health system to respond to future pandemics that we know that we can happen and will happen probably. We don't know if they will be so severe as uh, COVID-19, they will be more uh, less uh, severe, we cannot predict, so it's important to be prepared uh, to the worst case scenario. And this uh, also, we, I think that implies that we need to have more resilience, resilient health systems. And finally, to strengthen surveillance and research for non communicable disease. With resilient and comprehensive information system for health, including data on non communicable diseases and related COVID 19 outcomes. Data are very important, not only to show what is happening, but data are important if you can translate this data in strategies and policies that can address the problems, the barriers that the data are showing us. So it's very important in each country to have good data about the health conditions, about the risk factors of non-communicable diseases, about the impact of COVID-19, to identify the most vulnerable population to identify what is working well, what we need to, to improve in order to respond in a better way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jarvis. Thanks for that very, very comprehensive perspective, the overview in terms of where we were before the pandemic, the impact of the pandemic on health, the impact on the economy, and I will just sort of just leave the, the final points that you made, the whole importance of protecting the public health gains you made in terms of promoting the best spies, the importance of non communicable disease and mental health in primary health care as a key pillar. And I will state that even though the first webinar is on non communicable diseases, we will also have specific webinars on the mental health issue, which is a tremendous issue, which continues to be a growing challenge for us in the region. You also point out the importance of digital health the investment for health transformation, as well as the importance of data and surveillance. So thank you very much for that very comprehensive, um, in-depth review of the situation in America, Dr. Um, Dr. Barbosa. Okay, now it gives me great pleasure to welcome um, next to the um, panel, Dr. Rui Lopez Vidora. Now, Dr. Vidora made a presentation on behalf of Mexico, and basically he's currently <clears throat> the, um, the Director General of the um, Senate Police, the National Center for Preventive Programs in Disease Control, which is part of the Under Secretary for Prevention of Health and Health Promotion of the Federal Ministry of Health. Um, Dr. Ruiz um, Lopez Vidora basically um, has a PhD in Nutrition Epidemiology from the School of Public Health of, at Harvard. And um, he basically is also specialized in, 
in internal medicine, and he has extensive experience in, in the implementation of epidemiological studies and analysis of information um, through his work coordinating various epidemiological studies and surveys. He's also led the Diabetes and Risk Research Unit um, for Cardiovascular Diseases at the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico. So Dr. Rui, a pleasure to see you again and welcome. I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hennis, and, and y muchas gracias a todos por, por, por la invitación. And thank you, everyone, for the invitation and for including this uh, possibility provided to us in order to share what uh, we've been uh, doing in Mexico during the pandemic uh, in order to attempt to recover what has been limited in providing continuous care to patients with chronic diseases, particularly cardiometabolic diseases, which is where I'm going to concentrate today. But also the important message that we are sending out with Dr. Barbosa in this excellent presentation on the need for identifying this as a huge opportunity in order to strengthen primary health care in the region. And uh, we have uh, thus uh, seen that in our country. So let me discuss with you a few things uh, with the assistance of this presentation. Mm -hmm. I understand that, that you can see it on the screen. So let me move forward. So along the same lines and in the same context uh, as uh, Dr. Barbosa was uh, presenting this at uh, the huge impact that, that this has had on morbidity and mortality, the prevalence that we see in the region, and uh, in particular in Mexico, the impact that we see with a whole set of uh, risk factors of cardiovascular diseases or cardiometabolic uh, diseases that uh, in a very significant uh, share has uh, explained that the huge impact that the pandemic has had in our country. If we take a look at the latest figures, and this is from a couple of days ago, where we have close to 200,000 confirmed fatalities, so we've surpassed 200,000 today, but we continue to see the same pattern where a significant share is linked to comorbidities, particularly high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity. And when we see this as a proportion of how we account for 100% of the deaths confirmed by COVID, at least 73% have a comorbidity that has been identified, identified in the epidemiological study at the very beginning. And the remaining 27% did not identify any comorbidity, even though it is feasible that the under registration that we have with many of these uh, diseases and conditions, we can still not uh, assure that this 27% uh, did not show any comorbidity. But when we take a look at the comorbidities, we see that the most uh, of these have at least uh, one of these uh, four disorder or conditions or risk factors, diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, and cardiovascular diseases. So this has uh, compelled us to have and uh, to attach a priority number one in the response plan to COVID uh, to identify where we find uh, the major challenge that this has posed uh, for many years, uh, the weight of uh, chronic uh, diseases in the health of Mexicans. For over a decade now, we've had uh, more than one third of uh, the total number of fatalities every year are accounted for because of cardiovascular diseases. And we have high prevalence uh, levels. And at the latest uh, nutrition survey that was done in 2018, we saw that over 15% of prevalence of diabetes and 10% of these with uh, prior diagnosis and more than 35% of the prevalence of high blood pressure and half of them with a uh, knowledge of a diagnosis. And this obviously represents uh, the major challenge of the huge growing epidemic that we have in obesity in the different uh, age uh, stratum. From uh, the very beginning, we saw this uh, 
that was uh, published in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, where it was uh, describing this, uh, what uh, at first sight uh, seems to be a relation that might seem obvious, but it is very important to stress the huge component that, that chronic diseases as well as obesity, be it directly or indirectly, the role that they play through the increase in the risk in chronic diseases and how this has had an impact on negative results. But we have to understand that underlying all of this, the structural level of these epidemics, that there's several conditions where the social determinants of health that, that in the last few years have pushed them or promoted the situation of a population with the lifestyles and risk of factors that are not healthy, that have conditioned a health situation that is as severe even before the pandemic in our population. And the pandemic simply brought to the attention of everybody else that the impact that these conditions had. As you know, in Mexico, we begun with this administration since December 2018, uh, we started working with this administration and we said that before the pandemic, our two main uh, priorities uh, for cardiometabolic diseases, we had these two components. On the one hand, we created a, a strategy, an interministerial group or strategy in order to deal with the transformation of the agri-food system, the search for an agri-food system that would be fair, equitable, sustainable, and competitive. And this is a group that is known as HISAMAC, this intersecretarial group where we not only have the participation of the different sectors of government or the different levels of government, but also many, many other components of civil society and international agencies that have helped us in defining this transformation plan that uh, actively has led to the creation of different strategies, both at a normative level, as well as at a local level, looking for the transformation of the agri-food system. But the other component of a top priority for metabolic diseases, cardiometabolic diseases, is a model, transformation model, that is completely different from what, what uh, we were following in primary health care in the country. In this uh, program of our primary health care, we reinforced uh, the actions in a real establishment of what primary health care really means in the first uh, level of care that was uh, traditionally neglected or forgotten. Well, the first aspect, and, and I believe that Dr. Barbosa also mentioned this, it is important to identify the opportunity that uh, the negative impact that the pandemic has had in order to reinforce all these uh, strategies that, that uh, are looking for a healthier environment. And that is why the transformation of the entire agro-food uh, system, not only in education campaigns and not only in normative uh, policies of uh, the different spaces or the environments where individuals operate, but also in uh, transformative uh, actions of the food production system, where we're also working closely both with the Ministry of the Environment uh, and also with the Ministry of Agriculture. So these are some of the things that where we've made some progress, and we believe that precisely the impact of the pandemic has enabled us to be much more aggressive in how we move forward with these policies and the guidelines for selling and distribution of food and beverages in schools. Schools have been closed for a whole year. And this year we've been working on this. And now that we have the expectation of opening up educational spaces, it also becomes an opportunity to open these up as healthier spaces with a clear limited access and a reduction or complete elimination of any food that, that is not uh, nutritional with a high energy content but uh, low or nil nutritional value. We're also following this and we believe that uh, how sensitive the population is about uh, health issues in general and specifically in linking risk of factors with the complications that we see brought about by COVID shows that the communication campaign for a healthy nutrition can have much more impact in amending and modifying habits in children. As you know, for some time and even before the pandemic, we started working on the implementation of labeling 
front labeling uh, clear nutritional values uh, with the signs of uh, critical foodstuffs uh, where we based uh, this on Pajo's profile for food, for critical nutrients. And this has enabled us to have a policy of front labeling that is highly strengthened and reinforced. And precisely during the pandemic has enabled us to go beyond this with a push of a more effective implementation and the expectation of raising the levels so that increasingly more we can have a clear identification of ultra processed uh, foods uh, which uh, should be moving towards elimination regulating publicity and advertising and we're also working on an update uh, of uh, beverages that, that contain sugar and uh, food with high energy density before the pandemic or during the pandemic, uh, we performed this analysis and it's been extremely yes, useful in order to deliver the message to the population and to transforming the public policy. Where colleagues from the National Public Health Institute carried out uh, these estimates uh, with uh, over 40,000 excess uh, deaths uh, linked uh, to the consumption of uh, sugar drinks. So when we compare this with the excess mortality that we've had during COVID, it becomes an important element to say precisely now there's a risk factor that is drinks that contain sugar that is explaining the excess in mortality or had accounted for it for many years. And perhaps uh, during uh, COVID, it will also be one of the determining factors which has assisted us in order to promote uh, this public policy to reduce the consumption of uh, highly processed or ultra processed uh, food. The other component of uh, transformation of the care system, even though we had been working on this uh, from before the pandemic, uh, during the pandemic, uh, and after a few months uh, where we had a huge priority given to strengthening the capabilities and building capabilities in hospital care given to seriously affected patients. So we decided to strengthen the first level of care and not only the first level of care, but community action. We obtained these guidelines in July, a strategy to promote the health, the prevention, mitigation of COVID within the framework of primary health care and uh, within the community framework. And with this, a lot of the stimulus that, that was achieved in order to promote these guidelines and to follow their implementation in each one of the states in the country, we see these mortalities, mortality of serious cases during late care. We had clearly identified the late care of patients as one of the important factors of mortality. Also an even greater spread of the community to of the epidemic to rural community where care services which are more limited the first level of a limited care in its uh, link uh, with the community and with the integrated uh, network of services. And this is what we found with health services was that we had one first level of care that was not only disconnected or had significant limitations within the integrated health services networks, but it was also disconnected from the community and thus the urgent need to, to strengthen community action. Lack of knowledge by the population, uh, if to receive care about COVID and non-COVID and the risks in interrupting uh, care. So we did need in the different reopening plans to have a consolidated strategy much stronger than just the community care. And this is uh, what uh, we ended up having as a stimulus in order to set up uh, three components uh, that we had been working on, two of them from before the pandemic, which was a model for transformation, the health model for well-being, SABI, and another model, and I will go into it, that we adopted from the HOPS strategy from PAHO and WHO that we started uh, setting up from before the pandemic. And when we get into this component of a community COVID, where we had um, three types of uh, brigades or three types of actions, promotion action in the community, going from uh, household to household and providing closer care to people, then specialized brigades where we could all already have nurses, uh, physicians already going to the homes in order to ensure continuity of the care and their reference to the first level of care clinics. 
where we could promote uh, these uh, five factors, stratification of risk in the community in order to detect uh, early detection of chronic diseases, continuity of the care with access uh, to medicines, and uh, home uh, care and telemedicine, promotion of health in the community, identification, early identification of patients with non-communicable diseases and COVID symptoms for this uh, daily telemonitoring and early detection of complications and ending with an early hospitalization with these patients in order to reduce uh, mortality. But on the other hand, uh, with the issue from Senaparesa, which is a center that coordinates uh, the program for cardiometabolic diseases, special guidelines for mitigation and prevention of COVID, and to continue with the care for patients with diabetes and hypertension, essentially. It defined the guidelines for in order to continue providing care with household visits, with the telephone calls, and each state has been implementing different strategies, telemedicine, video calls, and access uh, to drugs, uh, supply of drugs, uh, and uh, so as to avoid that patients with chronic diseases will have to go to a care centers to receive the medicines. Identification of uh, these uh, patients uh, with uh, hypertensive uh, discontrol or that uh, needed more attention, and another component that uh, had to do with COVID that needed timely service by those who were following the decomposition to places where they could be taken care of, where they do not hope, they do, they do not have a special care for COVID or the presence of a high risk of disease such as cardiometabolic disorder and respiratory sim symptoms in order to take care of these on a timely fashion in the care centers. This is a gap that we had before we began with this administration and your very acquainted with these uh, charts so where you can see both uh, the gaps in the total number of people living with diabetes. This is the estimate that we have, of which uh, a certain percentage of that has been diagnosed and a high percentage of receives a uh, treatment, but only a smaller percentage uh, reaches uh, the objectives or the results uh, in health uh, that are expected or desired. These happens uh, with uh, diabetes and with hypertension. They're very similar gaps. We have a significant gap in timely diagnosis, but we also have a significant gap in achieve achieving the objectives in care. That is why when we started working with Pajos Group in Washington, and my gratitude to, to all of you for the work done in promoting this project, the Hearts Up Project, where we saw the opportunity of using it as a model, a practical model for implementation in order to improve the care for patients with cardiovascular diseases or the risk of a stroke at the first level of care. You're well acquainted with this. I will not go into the detail, but the Hearts Project is made up by these six major packages that goes from stratification, risk factors, but a very important part of it has to do with standardized protocols of greater impact and in Mexico, we went through a whole exercise at a national level that has been produced in each one of the entities of modifying the access to medicines. Traditionally, many of the drugs that we had for hypertension or for diabetes were not very effective. And that is precisely what we saw on the first level of care. And the medicines that the most effective or efficient medicines are, were found at higher levels, an intermediate level. And I will talk uh, with you about these specialized medical units or going to the second level of care. And we had to transform this. We had to bring highly effective and efficacious uh, medicines that, that uh, would allow us uh, to revert uh, the therapeutic inertia that is usually highly prevalent at the first level of care with uh, simple protocols uh, in order to scale this up uh, quickly in order to achieve control. And this has been a lot of the effort that was achieved uh, before the pandemic and during the pandemic in the procurement of centralized medicines and access to medicines at the first level, and that is being improved. Now, as uh, you know, the flow for this operation and something that I'd like to highlight on how we've adapted the hard strategy to the reality of our country has been essentially 
being able to have primary health care in this uh, these first level of care units. We apologize, but we lost uh, we lost uh, Dr. Rui. He's back. We had promoted a strategy about having specialized uh, units, uh, cardiometabolic uh, control at the first level of care. And these UNEMES uh, were left there, medical specialized uh, units, especially for diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. However, they had very little coverage and they had very little impact in order to improve the conditions of the entire first level. So we've been reverting this idea. And now we have these UNEMIS that are currently 100, but we've been increasing their number so that uh, they will be closer to the units, the first level of care units and that will be centers for mentoring and care center in order to approach uh, the first level of care units and that the entire first level of care can improve in this uh, transformation of the care and strengthening of uh, the networks and uh, health uh, services. This is a progress that we've made with hearts in Mexico during the pandemic. We've also been able to include more states. Originally, we had selected Chiapas and Sonora as one first phase of implementation. And now we have uh, seven additional states uh, in pre-implementation stage. And now we already have in rapid expansion the entire first level of care, even though we will preserve some units for assessment and monitoring of this implementation and to be able to have useful information to quickly escalate this into the entire territory. And last but not least, the only thing I'd like to say is that we have been working on strengthening early care of cardiovascular emergency situation. So we had a serious problem with this because of very delayed at times between the beginning of the program and patients had barely made it to a care center with a heart attack that could be solved. We're working on a strategy for treatment, both a pharmacological early treatment, as well as with the possibility of uh, strengthening the capacities for intervention and treatment. And we're doing this not only with the Ministry of Health, but throughout the entire sector, social security, uh, health services for government workers in order to build up institutional services. And uh, we're linking this to heart so that as of the modification of risk factors and the care at the first level of care, but also this important side that, that also needs uh, to be further strengthened in order to have an early uh, care given to heart attack. So we've been working on several factors and we believe that the pandemic uh, has come to give us a push. On the one hand, the strengthening of a community care, the first level of care of integrated service networks, but also a push to public policy in order to amend the environments where we do this. This is at the end of my presentation and I'm ready to answer whatever questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. We really appreciate it. And we'll come to the questions shortly, but. Now we're going to open up to um, doc, um, to Lieutenant Colonel Jerry Bostick from Barbados, who's going to give his presentation, and then we'll have um, some questions after that. So um, Lieutenant Colonel Bostick is a professional with tremendous experience in security and protocol matters, having spent more than 25 years in the Barbados Defense Force. He's a graduate of several, several military schools, including the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst, UK, the British Army School of Infantry, the US States Army School of Infantry, the United States Army School of the Americas. So he's really well prepared and he's actually been the person who has managed a health response in COVID. And um, he, um, Barbados has had his challenges, but has been able to, again, reclaim the space and make tremendous advances in terms of the challenges of COVID. So um, Lieutenant Colonel um, Bostick, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hennis, and good morning, everyone. Buenos dias todo el mundo. Uh, I am very happy to be here to make this presentation on behalf of Barbados. I will start by giving a few statistics, which I think are very, very important in, uh, in terms of this particular topic. Barbados, uh, with a population of approximately 287,000 persons, is one of the highest ranked countries in the world for centenarians per capita. 
and ranked 39th in the world for aging populations, third in, Latin, in the Americas behind United States and Canada. We have 17% of our population who are aged 55 and over and 11% aged 65 and over. When you add that to our situation in relation to NCDs, 53% of the population having one or more NCDs, and the fact that NCDs account for seven of the leading, the 10 leading causes of death in Barbados, you will understand exactly what we are facing. So that it was obvious to us from very early when we were planning our response to the COVID-19 pandemic, that our greatest challenges would indeed, as WHO and PAHO indicated, come from the vulnerable population of those living with NCDs and elderly persons. And so we started this fight and we had our first case back in March of 2020. And we started by recognizing that we had to do a number of things because first of all, we were challenged from a human resources perspective uh, in terms of being able to satisfy the requirements for COVID and maintain our NCD clinics. And also the whole question of physical distancing and so on and, and observing the COVID-19 protocols that place some significant restrictions on the numbers that we could accommodate within our primary and secondary tertiary healthcare facilities. So a number of initiatives had to be undertaken in order for us to be able to continue care as best we could in relation to persons living with NCDs. And I will mention some of those, but I will focus on just a few. First of all, we recognized from early that we had to we had to stockpile at least six months supply of medications of pharmaceuticals, especially for NCD patients. And this was in anticipation of an increase in global demand and also that global supply routes or supply chains might have been impacted by COVID. So we were able to maintain 90% of all medications required by NCD patients throughout the course of this pandemic. Regrettably, the distribution or the filling of uh, prescriptions and distribution of these prescriptions became a challenge for us. Firstly, because the elderly and those with NCDs live in fear of coming outdoors and mixing in spaces where there are large numbers. So they were remaining at home. And so we had to devise a method to deal with that. And we were able to introduce um, the filling of prescriptions by deposit and subsequently home delivery to NCD patients and elderly patients. And that proved to be very, very successful. We also contracted uh, some, what we call community health liaison officers for all 30 constituencies that constitute this country. And there, there are in the field and in the communities, integrating, mixing with persons and feeding us back information in relation to, to the elderly and persons who were living with, with ND, NCDs in the event that we had to make any sort of um, intervention. We are almost about to complete the refurbishment of two community outpatient clinics in the rural parts of the country. We've doubled the space at these clinics because they've been closed for the duration of the pandemic. And the intent is to use the three community clinics plus one of the polyclinics to deal to a large extent with pay patients or persons living with NCDs in order to be able to alleviate some of the challenges that we are facing at this point in time. We also purchased some portable dialysis machines that we located at the primary isolation facility because yes, the persons uh, using dialysis or needing dialysis also contracted COVID. And this was a bit of a challenge in the initial stages, but we were able to rectify that to a large extent. And throughout all of this, we've been able to, to complete a school's nutrition policy in collaboration with PAHO, the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill, and the Barbados Association of Medical Practitioners, because Obesity, especially childhood obesity, is a serious thing in this country. 
and we recognize just how serious it is because throughout the pandemic, 90% of the persons who were admitted to primary isolation were obese. So this is a clear and present danger for us. But the areas that I really want to focus in on is first of all, the transition, transitional community care program that we implemented back in November. And this has been very, very important because there was a significant reduction in NCD clients attending clinics at the hospital and the polyclinics and even in the private sector clinics. We had to devise a way to be able to continue some level of care for them. And the decline has been like 35% in primary care facilities. And even during lockdowns, when we've had periods of lockdown, the accident and emergency department at the, um, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, which is our lone tertiary facility, that saw an increase of up to about 40% in NCD patients attending clinics there, and a lot of them very ill. And this, this obviously was a um, serious cause for concern. But this particular program has about 40 officers, community health workers who go into the field. It's managed by two physicians, a public health nurse, a diabetic specialist nurse, and a social worker. And they're going to, and they're, they're target five, the 500 of the serious NCD patients or clients. We're going to increase it to about 2,000 by giving um, additional resources. But there, this program has been very effective using telemedicine, use, using electronic medical records and so on to be able to reach persons, to get back to the physicians and the nurses when there are issues. And then the use of telemedicine and the, the ability then of the doctors in the field to be able to speak to consultants at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. This really has proven to be a very, very successful program. Now, I would have indicated that we had about 90% of persons at primary isolation that were obese. And the fact that a lot of sick people were turning up, particularly after lockdowns at the accident and emergency, this is NCD patients. And then we started to see, especially from January, when we had a significant increase in positive cases, and perhaps the arrival of the UK variant back in December, we saw a lot of sick people visiting clinics, but unfortunately, visiting when they were really fully blown up with COVID. They were coming at a very, very late stage, and this resulted too in an increase in the number of deaths, especially with elderly persons who accounted for over 90% of the deaths, and all with comorbidities suffering with NCD, NCD. So this then caused us to move to the second initiative that I want to mention here, which is the Seek and Save initiative that was launched back in January. In this one, we contracted 300 students from the University of the West Indies, Cayfield campus, who would not have been attending um, classes at that point in time. And they were able to conduct household surveys throughout this country, 75,000 households they were able to do in a three week period. And the purpose of the surveys and the, that they conducted really was to identify all symptomatic persons, especially elderly persons, and also where there may be persons living in, in, in households with elderly persons who themselves, that is the, the younger persons or persons who don't have NCDs, but who were displaying COVID-19 symptoms. And that allowed us then to be able to do a serious um, testing project with those persons, both rapid tests and PCR tests, and also providing quarantine facilities at hotels at government expense in cases where elderly persons might have been compromised because of living conditions and with relatives who might have contracted COVID-19. And this one yielded some significant results and we believe that this might have saved quite a number of lives as well. The third thing I want to mention is the national NCD strategic plan for 2020, 2025. We were able to complete that last year 
And to implement parts of that plan, we had to modify it uh, because of the outbreak of COVID. But the plan speaks to a number of areas that we will continue to work on during this year. And we will have to manage these things along with the pandemic because we have to be able to walk and chew at the same time. But the critical areas here for me is the, the children nutrition policy, the school's nutrition policy, which is going to also inform a national policy, nutrition policy that we are going to be working on this year. And then there's a national cardiology project, which is very, very important because the clinics that were affected really um, have been the cardiac clinics and the diabetes clinics during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially at the height of the pandemic. And this cardiology project and the national cancer project, these are very, very important going forward during COVID and post COVID. And what we are doing here is really collaborating with all private sector medical facilities, especially urgent care centers, ambulance services and so on collaborating and integrating all of our systems and, and, and we're going to be having an integrated approach to managing these matters so that persons would not do not have to come to the hospital for certain types of treatment and also persons who find themselves in trouble can receive treatment before they actually arrive at the hospital because we're putting all the things in place outfitting the ambulances training up um, and standardizing training and procedures at all clinics in Barbados, private as well as public. And phase one of this project is on the way and we anticipate that we will be able to complete this project uh, before the end of this year. So this will be down to great benefit for persons living with NCDs. The other Two matters that I would like to raise here is the whole question of creating an atmosphere of confidence for persons living with defense cities and vulnerable persons, especially the elderly, to be able to come out and attend clinics and to do the things that they normally would do, the exercise programs and so forth. We try to provide some in-house training or uh, demonstrations for persons during lockdown, persons who are at home to be able to exercise at home to keep that going. But we, we, we recognize and, and the decision was made by the government. The first 100,000 doses of vaccines that we receive, we place at the top of the list, persons living with NCDs and the elderly population and so out of 62 or 63,000 doses that have been administered so far in the last few weeks, about one third of those doses went to persons living with NCDs and to the elderly. And that will continue as we are able to acquire additional vaccines. So human resources, we, we made a decision in this country early to contract some nurses from abroad. We got a 100 from Cuba who were here specifically for COVID related activities. And we have been renewing that contract because we still need those nurses here. And we also employed about 95 nurses from Ghana in the general healthcare population within the um, primary healthcare setting. And some of them have gone to the, some specialists to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. But without those nurses, being contracted, we would have had a serious or even more serious challenge in continuing healthcare services in this country, including healthcare services for persons with NCDs. Uh, and so those initiatives, and you know, I only have 15 minutes and that is why I'm not going to go any further, but we've been able to manage. We had a significant increase, as I said, for the first seven or eight months of the pandemic, we had just over 300 cases. And between the late December and now, we've had over 3,000 cases. And regrettably, a number of persons with NCDs have been impacted, as was, um, as was said to us. 
but we are managing. We, 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 there's another side of this thing. I don't, it will probably impact some of the other countries in the Americas, but we had a serious challenge when the hurricane season started and we'll have that same challenge this year, but we'll be better prepared because we were facing the, the possibility of having a national emergency caused by hurricane within the national pandemic COVID-19 and how would we cope with services, how would we cope with shelters, uh, especially for elderly persons, and how would we cope with persons with NCDs who may require shelter during a hurricane within the general population. So that is something I'm just throwing out here, but we were able to isolate a few um, shelters that were strictly for those vulnerable persons, but really we have to do a lot more going forward. So with those few remarks, um, that, is, that has been our existence. And a lot of these things, especially the technology, the use of technology and so on, and the initiatives that I just mentioned will continue post COVID. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Colonel, the Honorable Jeffrey Bostick, Minister of Health of Barbados. So we've again had some tremendous insights into how another country has managed the challenges of COVID. And, um, and there are similarities between the experiences of Mexico and Barbados. So we certainly heard about the need to um, focus on nutritional well-being, which is a common theme, the whole school policy in Barbados and the campaigns in Mexico, which is quite interesting that across different um, um, geospatial and, and cultural differences, there are things that are so similar. And then also, again, there are specific responses to COVID. And Dr. Rui Lopez Ridora spoke quite a lot about hearts and um, how they're using hearts to strengthen the first level of care. And Dr. Bosses spoke again about how they were able to mobilize um, different um, community health workers and different approaches in the community to, to strengthen um, the COVID response, including um, um, bringing nurses from other countries to, to, um, to tackle the challenges that were faced. So I think I'm going to, be, there are many questions that we have had in the, um, the, ch in the chat and in the, in the, in the rooms. We actually now have in the, the chat room over 500 participants. So I'm going to actually try to um, capture some of the questions that have been raised. And the first question I'm going to pose to both of you um, is what would you consider the key lessons learned as a result of the pandemic? And I'm going to pose that to Dr. Lopez Ridora first and then um, Lieutenant Colonel, the Honorable Jeffrey Wastick to follow. So what were some of the key lessons that um, your country learned as a result of COVID? And um, so that's, a, that's the question I'm going to pose to you. And then the question is, in terms of innovations that respond, resulted from the pandemic, what are some of the innovations that you might try to maintain into the future because of the importance and the value they brought? So Dr. Um, Rui, can I hand over to you to give your, your views in terms of what are some of the key lessons learned as well to the pandemic? Okay. And what are some of the innovations that you use that you would recommend should be continued into the healthcare systems going into the future? Thank you so much. So over to you, Dr. Rui. Muchas gracias eh, por, la, por la pregunta y digo, me gustaría tal vez re, reforzar. Thank eh, you for your question. I would like to reinforce what was mentioned here. I think among the most important lessons learned during the pandemic have to do with the urgent need to uh, have an integrated comprehensive uh, integration of the health system. We need to know that we need to um, strengthen all the networks related to health care provision. And this needs to be done in an integrated comprehensive manner. We had uh, a fragmented system, a disconnected system in all the different uh, networks at all the different levels. And we had a major disconnection, disconnect with the community. And therefore, this is one of the most important lessons learned. And what we have learned is that we need to strengthen. And I think one of the most important aspects that we need to um, take advantage of, which was implemented during the pandemic, is a community component of these networks where we are in the process of strengthening the uh, 
network close to the people so that people can come and receive health care and we need to clearly strengthen the first the primary care a primary health care level with a better response and control. I think the strategy of strengthening the specialized healthcare brigades is one of the components we need to maintain and reinforce post pandemic in order to be able to ensure a better rate of control. And, um, and this is what hearts has encouraged. And this is something we are taking advantage of and uh, in order to strengthen our systems. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Rui Lopez um, Ridora and Lieutenant Colonel, the Honorable Jeffrey Bostick. Again, it's very interesting that there were brigades in Mexico that went into the field to make a difference, and you had a similar experience in Barbados. So perhaps you can give us your take in terms of um, what were the key lessons learned as a result of the pandemic and the innovations that resulted from the pandemic that you consider should be incorporated into the provision of care in the future. So over to you. Thank you. One of the first things, lessons for me, um, I, I recall the PAHO representative here in Barbados saying to me very, very early that in order for us to be successful at our, with our plans for COVID, that we had to take the entire country along with us and have buy-in from the entire country. And this was a serious lesson because the all of country approach is what we are following and that is the correct one um, where we engage with the private sector and all sectors within this society to be able to provide um, the various levels of care that are required and that is very very important and that is something that must continue after COVID. I also believe that the what COVID has taught us is that we need to repurpose our polyclinics so that we, because another pandemic will come and we must be able to continue the level of care for those suffering with NCD6. It is a significant portion of the population. And the only way that we can do this is to have designated facilities for persons dealing with NCDs. And we are starting to do this right now. And those are the my two two major things. And the, the last one, of course, is never drop the guard. And my, my, my mantra of no retreat, no surrender it, um, is very applicable at this time. And sometimes just when you think that you have everything under control, it just takes one, one, one case to throw you into turmoil. Thank you so much, Honourable Minister. I will actually ask a follow-on question. You talked about the challenge of, of the natu natu natural disasters and climate change and in the terms of the context of hurricanes. How are you going to think about that this year? I know it's early in the year, but we're heading towards mid-year in about three months. How is that affecting your planning, given the fact that we're still in the pandemic? Over to you. Right. The Thank you for that. Actually, last year was a lesson for us. We, we were able to put something in place, not adequate enough in my opinion, but thank God we were not impacted. But this year, we have to treat to this in the same way that we have to treat to persons living with NCDs by having designated facilities and designated uh, healthcare professionals to be able to man these facilities, even during um, the passage of a hurricane, so that we do not have that big mixture of persons uh, at the facilities because we have to protect the elderly and those living with NCDs. Thank you so much, Honourable Minister. So Dr. Lopez Ridora, there were some questions in the chat um, which spoke about the whole issue of management of conditions. And it, there's a lot of conversation about cancer in particular. And there was actually a very sad case that someone spoke to. And there are also questions in terms of trying to ensure oversight and governance of the system particularly as it related to the challenges of, um, of COVID. So any, any lessons learned regarding, for example, management of conditions like cancers during the, during the pandemic, any lessons that were learned and any lessons you might wish to share with us from your perspective? Over to you. Yes, thank you very much for your question. And, um, 
following up on comments on the chat, we not only have individual but collective issues here. Yes, there is um, an outstanding agenda from before the pandemic regarding cancer. This is for our country, but I think it's in general in the region. And it is this, it is necessary to have co comprehensive uh, plans for managing cancer and uh, prevention and treatment of cancer in Mexico, as perhaps in other areas, uh, uh, we have had uh, uh, approaches, but sometimes they were disconnected to from other um, areas, and this cannot be so. We cannot have one given area of the health secretariat uh, that is focused on uh, risk prevention um, or early detection. No, everything needs to be connected to provide continuity in management. We proposed a, a national cancer program, which goes from detection uh, uh, to palliation. This was something we were thinking about before the pandemic. During the pandemic, we, there has been a decrease in the diagn diagnostic services for early diagnosis of cancer, especially cancers where uh, screening diagnosis or, or population screening has been effective and provenly so, and where we had a, a strengthened program, especially in um, some female cancers and other cancers, we uh, didn't have uh, screening methods for the general population, and we have oriented our efforts to look for signs and symptoms of alarm, uh, which allow us to identify uh, these symptoms and signs at the primary health level. Uh, but clearly, uh, these services have been negatively impacted, even more so than that of continuity of uh, treatment. I think uh, the impact of pandemic on continuation of uh, treatment has been less, but for a screening and early diagnosis, there has been a negative impact. Now, uh, the situation has been more complex and uh, some searches ha have been focused on looking for uh, treatments and uh, s search for treatment and um, purchases uh, and better distribution of medicines among the population. I think we have sound basis to strengthen this program as well. And we consider that a significant part for cancer will be defining standardized homogeneous protocols for all kinds of cancers. And especially in um, pediatric cancer, we need to have a, a heterogeneity of treatment protocols. And we have been working with different groups to be able to homogenize treatments and standardize them and detecting critical points, uh, which in cases of leukemias, many times we cannot reach the um, survival standards that have uh, been achieved elsewhere uh, so that we can achieve them in pediatric cancers and leukemias. Thank you so much, Dr. Rui. Um, Honorable Minister, I have a question for you. Now, in terms of um, the access, patients having access to services during times of um, lockdown during times of reduced contact to prevent transmission and so forth. Um, many countries have used digital platforms in telemedicine. Could you share a little bit with us about the use of telemedicine in Barbados and if this is an area that might be developed more following the pandemic? So over to your Honorable Minister. Thank you for that question. Yes, we, we, we have started to use telemedicine and it is proven to be very important even with the the community team that is out with dealing with the severe cases of diabetes 
Um, but we have to scale up significantly. And as a result of this pandemic, that is a direction that we will be going in. Um, we are digitizing all of our records in, in all of the public healthcare facilities. And I can say to you that the intent is for our polyclinics to be able to communicate by, via telemedicine with consultants at the hospital so that more people can be treated um, at the primary level without having to go to the hospital for treatment and to access care. So yes, telemedicine is going to be pivotal in our efforts going forward. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. Um, I think we've really, we're going to the last minute really in terms of what we were saying, but I think I will actually make a plug. And one of the plugs that is, one of the base of this plug is that um, the importance of non-communicable diseases has really become paramount. This is the first time we've seen such an interplay between a pandemic, we talked about obesity, we talked about um, other non-communicable diseases as being the driver for severe disease and, and, and increased mortality. We know that in our region of the Americas, non-communicable diseases account for eight of out of every 10 deaths. So we have all the evidence, all the information before us. And as we transform our health systems, as we build back, we have to be able to strengthen our response to non-communicable diseases. And we have to be able to incorporate management, prevention, control, and care for non-communicable diseases as a key pillar in primary health care and integrated health networks. I'm already seeing evidence of some of the, the movements and the transitions, the whole importance of the best buys, protecting the gains in, in health. And I noticed even in, in, the, in the chat, um, we talked about experience in Barbados where you're looking at a whole of a society response, which includes the private sector. And someone noted the, the fact that the private sector also has to play its role in, in terms of activities that are health promoting rather than harmful to health, which is also responsibility as we look for a better and improved society. So I will make the plea in terms of, as we build back, the, the, the strength and the whole relevance and the approach to management non-communicable diseases, tackling risk factors in the primary healthcare system as a key pillar as we build our integrated health networks. So thanks again to both of you, Dr. Reed lopez Ridora. Um, Lieutenant Colonel, the Honorable Jeffrey Bostick, Minister of Health of Barbados. And I think we really have had a really fulsome discussion on these factors. We thank you for the innovations that you've developed, use of health brigades in the community, et cetera, access to medications due to telemedicine. And I know as we look for the way forward, and um, as, as Lieutenant Colonel, um, the Honorable Jeffrey Bostick said, you have to do more than one thing at a time. It's not about a choice of health or the economy. You have to have an integrated approach and you have to strengthen the health system response. And we look forward to continuing to work with these countries and we look forward to sharing these experiences of what you have learned and what you're doing. We will make some of the presentations, we made the presentation, um, presentations available on our, on our website and we'll summarize some of the key points and lessons learned to share with our colleagues and countries. So again, thank you very much to both of you. Thank you for the team that's done all the background work to make this a reality. As I said before, this is, this is the first in, an, in a series of webinars we have now come to the end of this webinar session. I want to thank our speakers, particularly Lieutenant Colonel the Honorable Jeffrey Bostick of Barbados and Dr. Rui Lopez Ridora of Mexico for their excellent presentations. And all, of course, also to thank our Assistant Director, Dr. Jarvis Barbosa for his presentation, as well as the translators who have enabled us to deliver this bilingual session. I wish to thank my entire team and all those working behind the scenes in organizing this session. And I wish to thank all of you who have participated. We even had participants from as far as Pakistan on this webinar. I invite you to join our next session next month on Tuesday the 27th of April at 11 in the morning Eastern time for a second webinar, which will focus on mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic. Have a brilliant afternoon, the rest of the day, and until next month, again, thanks to all of your participation. It's an absolute pleasure to, to learn and share your experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.